Today on the show, we are very fortunate to have Dr. Sanjeev Chopra, who is a professor of medicine and former, former faculty dean for continuing medical education at Harvard Medical School. He currently serves as the Marshall Wolf Master Clinical Educator in the Department of Medicine at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. And for over a decade, Dr. Chopra has led one of the most robust academic continuing medical education enterprises in the world, reaching out to over 80,000 physicians in 125 countries every year. Dr. Chopra is also editor-in-chief of the hepatology section of UpToDate, an online resource for point of clinical care decision making used by over 1.2 million physicians in 195 countries. Dr. Chopra was designated a master of the American College of Physicians in 2009 and has earned a number of awards including the American Gastroenterological Association's Distinguished Educator Award. That is a mouthful. Um, in 2012, he was awarded the Ellis Island Medal of Honor that exemplifies outstanding qualities in both one's personal and professional life while continuing to preserve the richness of one's particular heritage. Dr. Chopra's best-selling author is a best-selling author of over 10 books and um, is a sought-after inspirational speaker throughout the United States and abroad. His latest book is co-authored by Gina Vild and entitled The Two Most Important Days, How to Find Your Purpose and Live a Happy and Healthy Life. So thank you so much, Dr. Chopra. This is quite a treat for our viewers. Rama, delighted to be on the show. So, so happy to have you here. Um, so I was going to ask you first off to start, describe your childhood. We're very intrigued to see what someone like you might have been like as a child. So what are a couple of things that you really remember about your childhood? I think the most uh, <clears throat> pleasant memories I have of my childhood is living in many different parts of India. Mm -hmm. Our father, I have one brother, Deepak Chopra, so two brothers. And our father was a cardiologist and professor of medicine, Armed Forces Medical College. And he would be posted every three years. So I, I was born in Pune, but then I lived in Jabalpur, Shillong, Assam, Delhi. And attending those schools, playing cricket, playing sports, imbibing amazing wisdom from my parents. My dad was pure intellect, intuition. My mother was full of heart. We had the most amazing uncles, mm -hmm. grandparents, who were unbelievably good storytellers. So I think life is storytelling, leadership is storytelling, and I learned a lot of lessons growing up in India. Wow, that sounds uh, uh, like an adventure already. That, that could be a next book for you. <laughs> um, so. When, did, did, you, did you know or think um, that um, you would be doing now, um, or well, let me rephrase that, did you know back then as a child that you would be doing this now, all the things that you do? Not all the things that adult. I do. I, I did know at age 12 that I was going to become a doctor. I had a very interesting experience. I was studying at St. Columbus High School in Delhi, arguably the number one all boys school in all of India. My brother was two years ahead of me. We were staying with my dad's younger brother and his wife, uncle and aunt, because my dad was posted 300 miles away and they wanted us, my parents wanted us to finish our education at this premier school. And one weekend, very sultry, warm weekend, I play a cricket match. Sunday, around five, six o'clock, I'm having a competition with my brother. It used to be in Reader's Digest, word power, vocabulary. And I'm not feeling that great. I take a nap, 30 minutes later I wake up, I open my eyes and I'm terrified. I can't see. So I close my eyes, open them again, I can't see. So I nudge my brother, I say, Deepak, I can't see. And he must have done visual thread and reckoned I am not faking it. And he and started to cry. he was 14? He was 14, right. 14 and a half. And he right. said, oh, I have one brother and he's turned blind. Right. And my uncle takes me to the military hospital doctors examine me, including, I believe, an ophthalmologist. Mm -hmm. They don't have the foggiest idea as to right. what's going on. I can hear them talking, and there's talk right. about hysterical blindness, oh, gosh. which is easy to distinguish. If you come in from the side with a sharp object and right. somebody's faking it, yeah. they'll blink. Right. And was I was a it. happy student. Right. I was a good athlete. Finally, they get a hold of my father, 1961, mm -hmm. Army Jeep, 
those trunk calls, right. big brick phone calls, right. phones, and very calmly, brilliant cardiologist, but he knew everything in medicine. He said, tell me everything that's happened to Sanjeev in the last two months. And they told him I'd had an injury to my right leg. I was taken to the casualty ward, got stitches. He asked about antibiotics. They mentioned, and then he asked two more questions. Did he get a tetanus shot? Mm -hmm. And very proudly they said, yes, we gave him a tetanus shot. 1961, he said, what kind? Anti-tetanus serum or anti-tetanus toxoid? And they said, anti-tetanus serum. He said, Sanjeev is having a rare idiosyncratic reaction to the ATS. It occurs perhaps less than one in a million. He has severe bilateral optic neuritis. His optic nerves are blown. They're ready to burst. Start an intravenous. Give him massive doses of corticosteroids. Wow. That was done, and about eight, nine hours okay. later, my vision returned. I remember all the military hospitals in India, the walls on the inside are painted green. Mm -hmm. And the next morning, I said, you know what? I want to be a doctor like my father. Right. That's my dharma. That's my vocation. Mm -hmm. Moral compass, authenticity, right. ethos, truth. I've told this Rama story to professors of ophthalmology right. around the country here at Mass Eye Stanford, Duke, right. UCLA, Hopkins. And right. they go, wow, how did your father know that? Right. Had that not been done, you could have been visually impaired for the rest of your life. Right. Yeah. So that was a choice I made at 12. Coming to America was when we were in finally a medical school, my wife and I. Mm -hmm. And the intention was to spend five years trained in gastroenterology. Mm -hmm my f chosen field. Right. She was going to do pediatrics and then go back. And then when you're here, you say, this is an amazing country. It's all meritocracy. There's mm -hmm. you know, the opportunity to advance. You can go into private practice. You right. can do academic. You can do teaching, research. Mm -hmm. So decided to stay. And it's been many, many years now. We came to America in 72. Mm -hmm. I tell my American friends, don't mess with me. I'm a Boston Brahmin. That's right. That's right. That's right. And and it and so it seems you you and you have you've done it all. You've done all those things that you yeah. described. Yeah, but so, one, one of right. one of the things I told my wife early on right. when we were doing our internship and residency, I said, by virtue of our work, we will have a lot of doctor friends. Mm -hmm. Let's make sure we have friends outside the profession right. in business and philanthropy and right. philosophy, electricians. Right they will enlarge our horizons and teach us a lot. And we've done that. Right. And I have th the most amazing friends in life. I one of them very spiritual. Right. And he's the one who 10 years ago or so said to me, Sanjeev, you won these awards. You've written these books. Mm -hmm. I said, Adrian, you know all this. Where's this conversation going? And he turned to me and he said, what is your purpose in life? So Amita, my wife, was in New York with the grandkids. Mm -hmm. I came back from the coffee shop, right. I sat on the deck, thought about it, I articulated my purpose, and everything I do now has to be aligned to my purpose, otherwise it's a distraction or a detour. Wow, that's so interesting. And that's, that's a great um, segue into your latest book. So thank you for, you just did my job for me. I love it. Um, and so tell us about this and how this lines up with your purpose, the, the two most important days. So tell us what those two most important days are and how, how this... Right. So what happened is that several years ago, I got invited to give a named lecture at Harvard Medical School, mm -hmm. the Nathan Seidel Lecture in Medicine and Humanities. Mm -hmm. And the person who invited me, a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, said, Sanjeev, you're a pretty good storyteller, so whatever topic you want to choose, you can choose. I said, Richard, let me get back to you in a week. So I reflected... And then I sent him an email and said, how about I give a talk and it'll be called Dharma, Happiness, and Living with Purpose. I think these three tenets are inextricably linked. And um, as I was preparing that talk, uh, friends, I would ask people the question, including young people, including my grandkids, complete the phrase, happiness is. Gina Weld, a colleague and friend, when I was the faculty dean for continuing education at Howard Med School, she was the associate dean of external communications and chief communication officer. So we worked very closely. She's been to India, met my family there. And she said to me one day, uh, I have a lot of friends on Facebook. Can I put 
complete, a friend is giving a talk. Mm -hmm. Can you complete the phrase, happiness is? I said, sure. So every 10 days she'd send me a ton of material. One day I came back from work around 8, 9 in the evening. And I, I got another email and I said, you know what, there's a ton of material here. I also prepared a talk. So I connected with her the next day and I said, let's write a book. It's all in my head. And, and you write very well and you're into poetry. And we write a book about happiness and living with purpose. It turns out there are 25,000 or more books with the word happiness in the title. Mm -hmm. So we chose this title, The Two Most right. Important Days, How to Find Your Purpose and Live a Happy and Healthier Life. Right. It's taken from a quote by Mark Twain, mm -hmm. who once famously said, the two most important days in your life are the day you're born and the day you find out why. Mm -hmm. Each one of us has a singular purpose in mm -hmm. life. Wow. And, um, What's what's different about this book um, as compared to your other numerous books that you've written? Yeah, well, you know, every book has had a different theme. I wrote a book on leadership, mm -hmm. Leadership by Example, the 10 Key Principles mm -hmm. of All Great Leaders, right. also based on a talk that I was giving around the country, mm -hmm. around the world. Some of my books have had to do with health issues. Right. I wrote a book called The Big Five, mm -hmm. Five Things We Can Do Based on Scientific Evidence right. to Live Longer. Right. And they include coffee, exercise, <laughs> vitamin D3, right. nuts, mm -hmm. and meditation. Mm -hmm. And when that book came out, I did about 25, 30 radio and TV events. Right. Some were 10 minutes long, some were 30 minutes. Right. And I told the moderator, person interviewing me, give me one minute at the end to summarize. Mm -hmm. Even though there are five things right. I want people to remember. Right. And they all did that. Right. So I said, here's the deal. On a good sunny day, go for a brisk walk right. to your favorite Java shop. Mm -hmm. Now you got the vitamin D from the sun, the exercise, right. and the coffee. Mm -hmm. Three out of the five. Right. Don't go nuts remembering this. Right. Number right. four. Right. And before you go, meditate. Right. And there's an ancient saying, you should meditate once a day. Uh -huh. And if you don't have time to do that, you should meditate twice a day. day. Right. And they all remembered that. Right. They'd meet me six months later, Sanjay, five things. So this book, uh, I think for me has been very special because it, it aligns with my purpose. Mm -hmm. I've expressed my purpose in there. Everything I do has to be aligned to my purpose. Right. And, and we tell stories of amazing people I've met, people mm -hmm. like Papa Jaime, mm -hmm. who has adopted 52,000 right. Orphans. Can't even imagine. And and if you see his face, you can see the bliss in his face. Right. He found his purpose in life some 40 years ago, witnessing the tragic death of a seven-year-old beautiful girl right. who ran up to the road to pick up a toy, and then a speeding truck came and smashed her into oblivion. Right. So I've met people like that, Jennifer Staple at Yale, Unite for Sight, mm -hmm. many, many people like that. Right. and. Uh, inspires me every day. Right. It seems like all the work you've done previously somehow um, connects into this feeling of um, finding your purpose and finding happiness as the primary yeah. Yeah. priority that people should have in their lives. Yeah. So, you know, uh, Rama, I think the four keys to happiness are happiest people on this planet have a cadre of good friends, mm -hmm. chosen family. Friend is a gift you give to yourself. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Friendship is a sweet responsibility, never an opportunity, mm -hmm. a quote by Khalil Gibran. Right. Second is ability to forgive. Mm -hmm. Anyone listening, if you're harboring any bitterness or rank in your heart, get rid of it. The moment you make that decision, you'll feel this enormous weight come off. Mm -hmm. And to me, the prime example is Nelson Mandela, who spent 27 years right, in prison. In prison. Right. And when he's released, he's asked the question, Mr. Mandela, do you have a resentment against right. your captors? Aren't you angry? Right. He said, I have no bitterness, I have no resentment. Resentment is like drinking poison right. and then hoping it will kill your enemies. Right. So friends, forgiveness. The third one is a quote by Albert Schweitzer, Nobel laureate, theologian, humanitarian, right. physician, and he once said, I don't know what your destiny will be, but one thing I'm certain of, the ones amongst you who will be truly happy are those who have sought and found how to serve. Right. So make others happy. Mentor, nurture, give. Give your time, your talents, your mm -hmm. skills. So I've distilled it into three Fs, friends, forgiveness for others. The fourth one begins with G, and it's not God, it's gratitude. Mm -hmm. 
If you don't know, there's a wonderful anonymous quote, if you don't know the language of gratitude, you will never be on speaking terms with happiness. Mm -hmm. Simple thing, gratitude right. journal, write down once a week what you're grateful for. Your happiness quotient goes through the roof. Mm -hmm. But I think happiness is more than the sum total of happy moments. Mm -hmm. And in order for us to have sustained happiness, we have to find our purpose and right. live it. It seems like you have to remind yourself of that every day. Yeah. After a while, though, it becomes Comes sort a habit. of habit. Right. And in the book, we give exercises, we tell stories. Um, I mentioned Adrian, my friend. We did a workshop called Invitation to Happiness. And we gave everyone 30 three by five cards. Mm -hmm. If you haven't found your purpose, here's an exercise you can do for a month. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day at night, as you're falling asleep, reflect on what transpired during the day. Write down two, three, four things you did on that card. Give it a rating. One, you were miserable. Ten, if you were lucky, you were in bliss. Mm -hmm. You'll find a lot of threes, fours, five, mm -hmm. six, seven, eights, maybe a few nines. At the end of a month, look at all of those and strike off one, two, three, four, five. Six, seven, eight, nine made you very happy, gave you joy, resonated mm -hmm. for you. Mm -hmm. Your purpose is lurking in there. Mm -hmm. You'll find it. Don't fight it. It'll come to you. Right. Wow. So this is, I can see why people call you the happiness doctor. <laughs> yeah. I did a couple of interviews with a station in New Zealand and Australia. And they started calling me the happiness doctor. Right. Doctor happiness. Yes. But uh, I'm very lucky. By nature, I'm happy. Mm -hmm. right. It turns out there's a, a happiness formula. Mm -hmm. And it's based on study of monozygotic twins and dizygotic twins. Mm -hmm. And what it says is that 50% of our happiness is genetic. It's mm -hmm. a set point. It's like the thermostat in this room. Mm -hmm. I think I inherited a good 50% of that. The only 10% uncanny is living conditions. 10%. Whether you live in a mansion in Beverly Hills, or in the slums of Calcutta or the shanty towns of Jodhpur, mm -hmm. as long as there's a roof, running water. 40% mm -hmm. is voluntary action. Mm -hmm. What we can do to make others happy, to mentor, right. to nurture. So to, it's largely psychological. Right? Amazing. But even that 50% that is genetic mm -hmm. is fluid and dynamic. And it can increase by exercise, okay. by meditation. Lots of coffee. <laughs> coffee, <laughs> behavioral cognitive therapy and the practice of gratitude. Right. So Robert Emmons, considered father of modern positive psychology, has written a wonderful book called Thanks. In it, he talks about his research mm -hmm. where they randomized a large group for six weeks. Half of them jotted down three random things they did during the day, at the end of the day. Right. And the other half jotted out three things they were grateful for. Hmm. We have numerous opportunities every day to be grateful for. Right. The group that expressed gratitude, that set point, went up by an astounding 25% in six weeks. Right. Simple, low tech, right? Yeah. Little notebook from yeah. CVS or Walgreens. Right. And that's the, best, that's the best kind because it's accessible journal. to everyone. Everyone. Right. Right. So what was, the, what was your favorite part? I know this book is really chock full of information. Yeah. It's one of these things that you really should reread four or five times just to absorb. I think, I think the favorite part things. was was uh, <clears throat> telling stories, telling stories of Papa Jaime and Jennifer Staple. I mean, these are people who so inspire us. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it sounds <clears throat> like I've been while so you were fortunate to have right. met them. While you were, it sounds like while you were writing this book, one almost feels reading it that you were really um, just loving the writing of it. Yeah, like putting this this together. Absolutely, right. you know the, the saying. Success is a journey, not a destination. Right. Albert Schweitzer, whom I mentioned earlier, once said, success is not the key to happiness. Happiness is the key to success. Mm -hmm. The ancient Greeks did not use the word happiness. Mm -hmm. They used the term eudaimonia, mm -hmm. which literally translated means human flourishing. Mm -hmm. Socrates was amongst the first to argue mm -hmm. that happiness was not bestowed upon a just a select few nobility, right. philosophers, poets, but the ordinary person was entitled to happiness and that happiness and virtue were inextricably linked mm -hmm. and could be begotten by human endeavor. I consider the children the modern day philosophers. Mm -hmm. So I gave a right. talk on this 
surgery grand rounds at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and the residency program director said, Sanjeev, can we have coffee and talk about this? So we met a week later. He says, I have a two and a half year old son. I asked him, what makes you happy? He says, Daddy, I'm most happy when I'm sharing my toys with my friends. Oh, that's very sweet. Isn't that amazing? I, I gave a talk at Wooster College, uh, Assumption College in Wooster, mm -hmm. and I share my slides with everyone. Mm -hmm. When they're taking notes, I say, no, you don't have to. You can use my slides. You don't have to give me attribution. I call it copy left. Mm -hmm. And one of the deans wrote to me and said, Dr. Chopra, great fun. I went over your talk with my husband, but I took your cue and asked my five-year-old daughter, mm -hmm. what is happiness? And my five-year-old daughter answered immediately, mommy, Happiness is when the heart feels bigger. What a great definition. It's a great, yeah, right. <laughs> and John Lennon, the Beatle, when he was right. five years of age, goes mm -hmm. to school and the teacher gives the kids an assignment, write down what you want to be when you grow up. Mm -hmm. He writes happy and he hands it to the teacher. Yeah. And the teacher says, John, you didn't understand the assignment. He looks up and he says, and you don't understand life. Oh, nice. Five years of age. Yeah, I bet that went over well. Right, yeah. His In mother, a, every night yes. when she tucked him into bed. Yeah. Said so John, when you grow up, I want you to be happy. Right. right. So when you're happy, you flourish in life. Right. Yeah, clearly. You sleep better, immune right. system, you're more creative. Right. So, so I, 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 I want to get your perspective on it. So, do you think that we're at a humanity is at a point in time where, unlike the the life and times of Socrates, they are um, open-minded enough to um, accept the gift of happiness and to practice it? That's a great question. I, I think you're, you're absolutely right that they are. I think, uh, great question. I think we're gonna learn from children again, right. the Greta Thunbergs of the world, your kids, my right. kids, my grandkids. <clears throat> uh, we, we can also learn from fictional characters. Um, there's a wonderful cartoon of Snoopy and Charlie Brown and they're looking at the sunset and Charlie Brown says, we only live once. And Snoopy says, wrong, we only die once. We live every day. Look at that philosophy. Right. And, and Winnie the Pooh and Piglet. Mm -hmm. So Winnie the Pooh says to Piglet, talk about the most sublime friendship and love. Yeah. Says to Piglet, if you live to be a hundred years, I want to live to be a hundred minus one day because I cannot live a day without you. Oh, that's adorable. <laughs> right. So I was interviewed by yeah. BBC after the book had come out and we'd written a blog about this. And the reporter said, Dr. Chopra, you're a professor of medicine at Howard Medical mm -hmm. School. You're quoting Winnie the Pooh. Uh -huh. I said, yeah, there's so much wisdom. Yeah, it's amazing how A.A. Milne came old. up with all these things, yeah. right? I wonder Isn't what it? was in his mind like, to Brilliant. come up with these Brilliant. things. Right? Brilliant. That's amazing. So I'm, I'm eternally optimistic. Right. I think the future is bright. Mm -hmm. I think children will be the ones who will inspire us, young people. <clears throat> One of my favorite quotes is from Oprah Winfrey who once said, the future is so bright, mm -hmm. it hurts my eyes. That's right. What a great sure. quote. That's a great quote, right, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. amazing, that's fantastic. And, and so what's next for you? So next, um, you know. Not that you no, haven't, no, you're I, not I, already I, doing a lot. That's a great lot, question. <laughs> and I think about it a lot. There are five things that are said. I should have traveled more. Mm -hmm. I should have spent more time with my friends. I should have been the bigger person and said I'm sorry. I should have had the courage to pursue my dreams and aspirations. I should have said I love you more often. You know who says these five things? People in hospice. Right. When asked what are your greatest regrets in life, nobody says I should have worked harder. That's true. Right? Lived right. in a bigger mansion. Should have spent more time at the office. country clubs. Spent more time in the office. So I'm, I'm so aware of this. This is the nurse who interviewed like a thousand mm -hmm. people in hospice right. facing imminent death. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's imprinted in my mind. Mm -hmm. And I try to live that every single day. I don't want to have any regrets on my deathbed. Mm -hmm. And I try to share this message with as many people as I can. Say, so let's none of us have any of these regrets. Right. So everything I'm going to do now has to be a, a, along those lines. Spend more time right. with friends and 
friends, of course, your family can right. be your best friends. Right. And travel more and say I love you more often and have the courage to pursue my dreams and aspirations. Right. <clears throat> Spend more time be with the, the bigger person right. and say I'm sorry. And one of my quotes that I like is Harry Truman who once <laughs> said, never ruin an apology with an excuse. Right? So right. When you apologize, you apologize. Right. You don't say, oh, the traffic was terrible. Yeah. That's why I'm right. 40 minutes late. Right. Uh, and spend right. more time with my grandchildren. grandchildren. Right. You know, uh, yeah. you don't have grandchildren now. No, You're too not young. Yet. Not yet. But, but when it happens, it will change your life. Right. You love your children with your heart. That's true. You love your grandchildren with your heart mm -hmm. and soul. Right. The only reason to have children is so that they can beget your grandchildren. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm right. sure your parents feel that way. Yeah. Right? I, See, those you know, parents. That's, yeah. The, my parents are so much nicer to the grandchildren. <laughs> they are, really are. And, and you know why grandchildren and grandparents get along right. so well? Right. They have a common enemy. That's true. <laughs> that's true. Just, I'm going to edit that part now. Just kidding. <laughs> that Just part kidding. you can We don't want anyone to hear that part. No, no, I'm, no. I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. That's, yeah. that's wonderful. When my brother had his first grandchild, I said, Deepak, uh, how's the feeling? He said, there's only one word or two words, enchanting, intoxicating. And children, you know, one of my favorite quotes again is from Tagore. Mm -hmm. uh, and he said, every child comes with the message that God is not yet discouraged of man. Yeah. With all the wars and killings right. and right. petty stuff going there's on. There's a positive note. Every child. Right. Yeah. God is not yet discouraged not yet. of man. Right. Wow, amazing. I'm, I'm just so fascinated that you remember all these quotes in your head. I'm very lucky I have a very good memory. I, you really do. Yeah, I know. just lucky. I know, right? Happy awesome. in medicine. Yes. In life. So that I know I've given you um, um, lots of ideas for book titles with yeah. every question that I've asked you. <laughs> uh, but so your, your uh, next work will be on coffee? On coffee. I'm writing a book on coffee. <clears throat> um, I'm going to call it Coffee, the Magical Elixir. Right. Facts that will astound and perk you up. Very nice. So coffee lowers the risk of seven common cancers, uh -huh. lowers the risk of diabetes, Parkinsonism, uh -huh. cognitive decline, early Alzheimer's, diabetes. People who already have diabetes, if they drink two cups, 30% reduction right. in cardiovascular mortality, mechanistic explanations, dose-dependent effects. Uh -huh. Rama, one of the, you know, I'm a liver specialist. One right. of the things that intrigued people in our field for mm -hmm. decades. How come there are some people who drink a pint of whiskey a day? Right. And at the end of 20 years, only 20% develop cirrhosis of the liver. Right. What happened to the other 80%? Right. We would think it's genetic polymorphism, mm -hmm. the way they metabolize al alcohol. Right. You know what the answer is? Coffee. So they drank an equivalent if you, amount no, of coffee? No, if you drink or? that much alcohol right. and drink one cup of uh -huh. regular coffee, right. A day, 20% right. reduction in alcoholic cirrhosis, uh -huh. two cups, 40%, oh, wow. four cups, 80%, wow. five cups, close to 100%. Wow. It's not a license to drink heavily and drink coffee. You can still get Korsakoff psychosis, cardiomyopathy, pancreatitis, kill people on the road, ruin your marriage, wow. but it right. protects your liver. Huh. So on the liver service at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, yeah. I taught the house staff and fellows 20 patients, 25 patients, right. end-stage liver disease, the worst. Ask every patient about coffee. Right. I do rounds for a month in the year. Right. I'd sit down for rounds. Right. Dr. Chopra, nobody drinks coffee. Oh boy. One day I sit down for rounds and the intern's got a grin. He says, we finally have a patient. Right. And you told us it has to be regular coffee. Uh -huh. not, not decaf. Not decaf doesn't protect against cirrhosis. I see. He says, so we asked him. He right. drinks four cups of regular right. coffee a day. And we asked him about the size, and he pointed to a paper cup. Okay, so I it's said a, these, it's a yeah, small amount. Yeah, eight ounces. So it's not the Dunkin' Donuts yeah, super not, size. Yeah. Me, that would be two cups. Yeah, the child size. Yeah. Right. So I said, these are epidemiological studies, but huh. I'll take my own history. Mm -hmm. So we go for rounds. We, I sit down, take a detailed history. At the end, I said, tell me about tea and coffee. Mm -hmm. He says, Doc, I don't like tea. I love coffee. Mm -hmm. I said, what do you drink? He said, if you're a drink, you might as well drink the real stuff. Sure. I said, how many cups? He goes, four cups. And then he's anticipating the next question, so he points to the paper cup. Right. right. I asked one more question. Uh -huh. How long have you been drinking coffee? Right. And he goes, since my liver transplant. 
Oh, wow. Okay. Wow. So he says, well, you know, Doc, I never drank coffee. I got my transplant. I now crave for coffee. Right. Should I stop it? I said, keep drinking. So he was admitted because he had bad cellulitis. Uh -huh. They're immunosuppressed. We take it very seriously, right. infections. So I've yet to come across an individual who drank a lot of coffee and developed cirrhosis of the liver. <laughs> Voltaire, the French philosopher, lived to the ripe old age of 83 years. Mm -hmm. And it's not clear that he lived to that age because he drank a lot of coffee. Mm -hmm. Life expectancy then was around 35, 40 right. years. You know how many cups he drank? Yeah. No idea. 50 to 72. A, a day? day? Wow. Now, when I mention this in some no of my talks... No wonder he got a lot of work done. <laughs> maybe in the bathroom. No, good grief. So, uh, when I mention this, sometimes people in the audience right. raise their hand and say, what size? And I said, how does it matter? Right. Even if it's this much, 72 adds up to a lot. Right. Teddy Roosevelt drank right. a lot of coffee. coffee. Yeah. And his grandson said, Grandpa's coffee mug was so large, it was more akin to a bathtub. Yeah. Wow. Jefferson drank a lot of coffee. Good grief. I, I need to now know how much sleep all these people got after all this co yeah. se 70 yeah, cups of question. coffee. Can you good imagine? grief. Yeah. Well, I, I happen to love coffee right. and I drink three to four cups a day, mm -hmm. but I cannot have regular coffee and I won't even chance decaf coffee after five o'clock in right. the evening. Right. I'll That's be up all night. So the doctor's but by prescription. then I've had it. So the happiness doctor's prescription for coffee is about three cups before two, four o'clock. Two to four cups. Okay. Two to four cups before, before, before four o'clock. Okay, we'll, we'll make a yeah. note of that. Wow, yeah. that's been wonderful. That You were just a font of information. This has <laughs> been so you. exciting. And, and now I should take you out for a cup of coffee <laughs> at the end of this. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, my pleasure. Yes, Great to be you. with you. And please, if there's anything else you'd like to add. No, I think... That's you're, it. you're good. It's your prescription for happiness yeah. is done. All right. Yeah. Good to know. Good, good, good. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you. Lovely. That was great. Thank fun. you, Paul. Hey, Paul. Yes, How do we do? Excellent. Okay. Good.